The earth was created, not with the gentle caress of love, but with the brutal violence of rape. In evolution's greatest irony, one of the first creatures to appear would be the last to remain. For incubating in the darkened womb of prehistory was a seed of grotesque variation, a fetus with the capability to dominate all. Masked beneath the beauty of nature's world is one single and ugly truth. Life must take life in the interest of life itself. It is the mistake of arrogance to equate size with significance. For the less visible one's enemy, the more powerful his threat. My name is Nils Hellstrom. That name rings a bell at all. It's probably in connection with the words fanatic, lunatic, heretic. Actually, I'm a scientist. And these other descriptions have come as a result of my dedication and my work. My obsession, some have called it, with certain findings I've made. 
It's not easy to be obsessed. The past 18 months, it's cost me two fellowships, one assistant professorship, and uh, even a few friendships. I don't care about that, really. In a way, it's kind of flattering. What I really regret is that after nine years of concentrated work, I've learned something that no one wants to hear. But unless someone does hear, unless someone is at least exposed to it, we as a species might pass from existence without ever knowing why. This is the radiation laboratory of Rock Valley, Nevada a carefully controlled, highly quarantined area where tests on the effects of radiation on living tissue are conducted. When man first began to wonder whether or not he could withstand the effects of his own technology, what his future in a heavily radioactive environment would be, he began comparing his own powers against those of other animals. To most of the animals he tested, he found he was equally vulnerable. But into this irradiated environment where all living things began to die, came an unexpected survivor. One creature that lived on as others faded from existence. This one creature that had survived the historical ages of ice and flood, of volcanic eruption and fire, the insect in a frightening tour de force of adaptability, proved conclusively that he could endure where man would ultimately fail. This and other evidence leads me to the following belief. I'll tell it to you once, I'll tell it to you simply. I'll tell it to you in terms that no one likes to hear. If any living species is to inherit the earth, it will not be man. Long before the time that hydrogen bombs and pollution have put an end to us, we will face competition for the earth itself from a life form we arrogantly ignore. We will be overrun, deposed, and succeeded by an army that was here long before us and is ultimately better equipped to survive than we. Battalions of mindless soldiers entering the contest with capabilities beyond our imagination. Yes, I'm talking about insects. And if you at this moment dare to think this is lunacy, I invite you to remain in your seat draw your own conclusion, and learn the inevitable destiny of ignorance. Primeval planet Earth, an arena of continual contest where only the most versatile and resourceful can endure. An atmosphere lacking in oxygen, scorched by day, frozen by night, continually bombarded by the deadly radioactive rays of the sun, in this testing ground where the mighty dinosaur would stagger and fall, one silent witness hangs on. With a 300 million year head start on man, the insect begins to develop his powers. He dominates the earth and exploits his dominion well. With each new generation come new experiments in shape and function, transforming him into specters as limitless as the imagination of the insane.
Unlike other creatures who struggled against their environment, he learned early to seek its protective embrace. Creating an endless wardrobe of camouflage, he and his environment became one. When the predators came, he was nowhere to be found. So artistic his methods of deception that they would crawl upon his body in their very search for prey. the true miracle of his escape had yet to come. At a time before other creatures were even aware there was a sky, the insect was able to leave the ground. Fifty million years before the first bird would appear, the insect had accomplished flight. An ingenious system of hinges and muscles carrying his awkward body upward in sublime defiance of the hungry creatures below. Having exploited the water and land, now into a virgin sky they soared. Their instinctive need for expansion nurtured by the winds of heaven itself. Like a cloud of contagious virus, they sweep across the land, infecting with their numbers the entire face of the globe. But the prehistoric Earth is not without defense, for carefully interwoven in the matrix of innocent beauty is a macabre masterpiece of revenge. Plants, too, have become predators. The cobra plant luring its victims into a maze where they will be constricted and digested without mercy. Gaping its jaws with menacing hunger, the Venus flytrap beckons with gentle perfume.
the beautiful Sundu, a murderess in disguise, tempting with imitation succulents all to come forth. Instead of sweet nectar, they will find sticky paste. Their very struggle to escape, exciting the deadly tentacles to descend. Their indifference born of necessity, others too become an instrument of death. It was the very hardship of life that stimulated their incredible resourcefulness. With an overpowering urge to survive, certain insects began pooling their resources to form a defense against the treachery outside. In a climate of deficient rain and sparse vegetation, the harvester ant took the first primitive step toward agriculture, gathering seeds during periods of abundance to store them below ground where they would provide food for the colony during the months of drought. While the adults are out working in the field, the young take on the responsibility of child rearing. Gathering the eggs and larvae into a communal nursery they tend the infants and the unborn with the meticulous care of a midwife. There are several stages of fetal development, and each is attended differently. The specific instructions carried chemically on the skin of the larva are as clearly readable to the nurse ant as a written prescription. For the soon-to-be-born larva, a predigested formula must be made, the nurse ant regurgitating it directly into the newly formed mouth. As soon as the young are born, they must take over the job of nursing, freeing their own nurses for work in the fields. Into their subsistence diet falls an occasional gourmet's delight. A dead bee becomes a banquet, and they will guard it with their lives. The instinct to harvest is akin to the instinct of greed. To a neighboring colony of red harvesters, the temptation has become too great. Over the carcass of a bee, they plunge themselves into destruction.
like a battle of gruesome robots once they begin they cannot stop with their own parts strewn upon the ground they continue to fight the battle ending only when the last of them is dismembered and dead let it be said of the harvester ant that he displayed more than one similarity to man As a scientist, I would very much like to have been on hand during the first seven days of creation. I would like to have seen the ironic smile on the creator's face as it gave each creature a different strength, knowing full well that eventually only two among them would be left to fight for what remained of the Earth. That seems preposterous. Here's a little fact for you. Today, as most other animal species are diminishing in population, only two are definitely on the increase. Man and insect. Man, because he is the only creature with the ability to radically change the Earth. And the insect, because he is the only creature who can adapt to whatever changes man can make. When you see him in a certain perspective, it is we who are the dwarfs. He who is the giant. He can pull an object a hundred times his weight, jump a distance 50 times his size. And if he's carrying the right kind of juice, kill tiny creatures like us with a simple bite in the back of the neck. Assuming for the moment that he is our opponent, let's see in a physical sense what he has going for him. Face is functional and without expression. Only eyes and a mouth, just enough to keep the rest of the body alive. No muscles to smile with, or frown with, or in any way betray what's lurking beneath the surface. You'll notice he has no ears or nose, but don't think it makes him oblivious. He can see us and hear us through a thousand tiny hairs that warn him of our presence in every pore of his body. Compared to man, he's considered primitive. But for this reason, he's ultimately more durable. Their life begins as ours, the fertilization of a single cell. of creation seen in this minute is the product of six short days. In the time it will take a single human embryo to develop, this insect could reproduce 401 billion, 360 million of his kind. Unnoticed and unloved, they come into this world possessing all the knowledge they will need for an entire lifetime. None will teach them, none will shelter. Programmed from birth to death, each has inherited the total sum of 300 million years' experience. They are born now because the lessons were learned then. Physically, they are a miracle of engineering. Their skeleton is on the outside, allowing greater leverage to muscles within. They move by a system of hinges, flexing an infinite variation as the situation demands. Air is taken not by lungs, but directly into the skin, by a body that acts as a bellows. Defense mechanisms are everywhere spikes and prickles, stingers and thorns, burning chemicals and poison spears that jut angrily into the air. Like a finely honed machine, his jaws are sharpened as they cut, his feet giving firm foothold, extending his mobility into areas where few others dare go.
Even his heart is something alien. A colorless substance courses through his body in response to the spasms of a transparent chamber. Unlike man, whose physical limitations are dictated from the moment of his birth, the insect is born with the ability to actually improve upon his own body. When he reaches the limits of his capability, he miraculously transforms into an entirely new being. The caterpillar is born with only half the equipment he needs for survival, for his only function in life is to eat. Denied the ability to reproduce, he would die before fostering others of his kind. But from his incomplete body, he will salvage new life. Hardening from within, his skin begins to split, extruding with convulsion an alien, sleeping form. Through a process similar to the contractions of birth, the new form squeezes outward into the air, a creature with no resemblance to the life it had just hours before. Now helpless, without eyes or legs, the pupil form extends a club-shaped appendage and struggles desperately to attach itself to the branch. Having outlived his function, the caterpillar is gone, his pathetically shriveled remnant cast off like a worn-out coat. It is the miraculous process of metamorphosis. In hours, the unsightly mummy has been wrapped in beauty, a coffin adorned with jewels where he will slumber until the signal comes to awaken. Within the privacy of this chrysalis, his transformation becomes complete new cells replacing the old to create an entirely fresh existence, a creature with no awareness, no memory of any existence past. Where the thorn once stood, now stands the rose. But like his predecessor, the butterfly too has only one function in life. Whereas the caterpillar lived only to eat, he lives only to mate. Lacking a mouth to chew with, from flowers he draws liquid sustenance, mixing with them to create the most beautiful visual harmony in all of nature's symphony. This is the main computer center at the California Institute of Technology. 
Here, the most sophisticated machinery man has at his command is being used to study the primitive brain of the insect, and to document and probe the astounding efficiency of such a simple mechanism. Compared with man, we have to admit that the insect does not display what we could describe as intelligence. But don't feel too proud about that, because where there is no intelligence, there is also no stupidity. His brain is without evaluative power. It has no capacity to reason or to hesitate before reacting. Ironically, this works in his favor. For without man's burden of injecting emotion into what he sees, the insect reacts instantaneously, without regret, without regard for any but himself. Rather like a primitive computer, able to respond to information at the flick of a switch. Now, I wouldn't dare compare a brainless insect to man's brilliant computer, would I? Think about it. A computer is a mechanism programmed with a thousand tiny bits of information. It operates by juggling that information into a form of logic. I humbly submit, it's not without analogy in the insect world. The living prototype of the computer was designed by nature herself, long before man ever set foot on Earth. The termite mound, one of the first experiments in social order. Deceptively tranquil facades masking the intricate workings within. Moving through the hidden circuits, a thousand tiny particles of information organize themselves into a form of indisputable logic. Their source of power are their queens, great throbbing masses of energy, motivating all with their insatiable need. Should a queen be allowed to die, the rest will perish too, for within her pulsating body lies the future of the mound. She may live a half century, tended by endless generations of her offspring. Unable to feed herself or move, she exists to manufacture one product, the indispensable commodity of new life. At the rate of 10,000 per day, eggs exude with the regularity of assembly line production, carefully sorted out, counted and stored by the workers in subterranean nurseries, where they will incubate until the time of their birth. Once born, they too will make their demands, requiring continual feeding until the time they can fend for themselves. Never able to leave the protective walls of their mound, they come into a world that is completely self-sufficient. In one section is a garden, a working insect farm where tiny mushrooms are carefully cultivated to supply a never-ending source of food. The entire society is guarded by soldiers, sentries equipped with outsized jaws, who will warn with a snap of their heads if the mound is ever invaded by enemies. Their greatest enemy is the sun, its scorching rays drying their protective walls to the consistency of dust. The mound ripped open, they stand defenseless against attack. Moving with sudden frenzy, the soldiers assess the damage. 
With frightening efficiency, the mound suddenly comes alive. A troop of workers proceeding with incredible speed to heal their wound before the predators arrive. Exuding paste from special glands, they fight to rebuild their shield. But in their work is desperation, for the drying rays of the sun begin to suck the life from them too. Alerted to their helplessness by a scent in the air, a battalion of black ants has marched in for the kill. Rising to the job they were born for, the soldiers move unquestioningly into battle. Heedless of a battle that rages only inches away, the workers toil ceaselessly to seal off their world from the dangers outside. Deep within the catacombs, sudden attention has turned to the queens. The workers risking suffocation in an attempt to roll their enormous bodies to a place of concealment. Once there, they will be walled in, covered by earth until the battle is over. With suicidal dedication, the soldiers continue to fight, attaching themselves to their enemies so that even in death, they will hold them back. When the walls are sealed, the war is over. But now the outnumbered termite soldiers bear the full fury of attack. For what is left of them, there will be no re-entry to the mound. They fought to have it sealed, and they will die because they won. Obsolete components, they are no longer useful to the whole, condemned by their inflexible programming to the continuation of their kind. It's long been Hollywood's contention that the mere threat of having an insect crawl upon your face is enough to make a grown man beg for mercy and tell every secret he ever knew. Psychiatrists tell me that from childhood nightmares to adult schizophrenia, the insect is a common fixation in the human mind. 
Partly because his face seems so evil. Partly because he is so indestructible. <laughs> I did something a few weeks ago. Experiments, you might call them. Sort of a hidden camera to demonstrate the extent of human fear in regard to insects. <laughs> it was very revealing. Some of mankind's fears of insects spring from the imagination, but most are frighteningly real. Each year, more of the world's population is killed by insect-borne diseases than by any other single cause. More than wars, highway deaths, old age. And this is a fact that you can look up and verify. Diseases like bubonic plague, malaria, encephalitis, yellow fever, typhus, black plague, cholera. You name it, they carry it. This demonstration would work as well with a live human being as with a laboratory animal. In 30 seconds, the mouse will be dead, paralyzed by toxins which in certain stinging insects can be as lethal as a cobra bite. Today, increasing numbers of people are born with a fatal allergy to wasps and bees. It's called an anaphylaxis reaction. For them, a sting in the leg will stop the heart as quickly as though it had been hit by a bullet. And here, here's the master executioner of them all, the mosquito. Genus Anopheles, number one killer of man on the planet Earth, capable of carrying malaria in 12 different varieties. Ever wonder how David slew Goliath? Like the insect, he wasn't afraid to die. Disease is only a part of it, for the insect has an even deadlier method of crippling man. It is to strike directly at his food source. Each day, as man's population increases, he finds himself in deepening competition with the insect to devour the Earth's resources. The insect has been called a walking digestive tract, and not without reason. To support his own life, he will consume as much as a hundred times his own weight each day, which to each of us would be like eating an entire cow, a herd of 30 each month. And as the insect population grows, he naturally needs more. To those who have witnessed the hideous display of appetite, the outcome is clear. If allowed to continue on his reproductive rampage, the insect will defoliate the earth. If the race for food is to be the deciding conflict, let no one say it came without warning. From the beginning of time, man has stood helpless, watching the very soil he nurtures give birth to his deadliest enemy, 
A ghost of biblical terror, he rises still, summoning his sleeping troops to pillage and destroy everything that lies in their way. In the innocent disguise of grasshoppers, they will wait endless years until something in the air signals the time is right. Then massing together, their bodies begin to change. Like Jekyll into Hyde, great jaws and wings burgeoning outward as they begin their monstrous flight into hell. Too late, they are recognized as the locusts. is a single animal, its body covering 400 miles, its mouth consuming 80,000 tons of food each day. In a single week, it will devour what could have fed one million people for an entire year. technology, man fights back. To most, man's efficient poison will bring instant death. But the few who survive will develop an immunity, a tolerance to ingest the poison with no harmful effect. Returning to the silence of the earth, they will pass on this immunity to new generations of billions. Too late is man becoming aware of his mistake. Yeah. First year we had him licked. We sprayed DDT like everybody else. A couple of days he's gone. I mean, we did see one. Said, <laughs> oh boy, thank God for that good old DDT, you know? And what about last year? Well, last year we sprayed Dildren. This regular DDT just didn't seem to do it. I mean, just didn't work. And this Dildren is maybe Oh, 100 times more powerful. And it killed them? Well, some of them, about a half. You know, we got maybe half a crop. And what about this year? Well, this year. This year, we sprayed with DDT and Deldrin. And we sprayed and we sprayed and didn't do any good. I mean, it, they just kept coming. It was almost like they liked it, like, like it tasted good. We, we must have sprayed 10 times more than normal. But you killed them? Yeah, we killed them. And what about your crop? Well, it's condemned. It's poison. We licked them, all right, but we gotta burn it. We gotta burn it all. In fighting the insect, we have killed ourselves, polluted our water, poisoned our wildlife, permeated our own flesh with deadly toxins. The insect becomes immune, and we are poisoned. In fighting with superior intellect, we have outsmarted ourselves. Before marching into battle, it's wise to assess not the weaknesses of one's enemy, 
but the strengths of one's enemy. Not only his innate physical and mental capacity, but his technology. If technology seems a strange word to apply to insects, you're in for a surprise. Let's start with communication. In its most basic form, one creature's ability to communicate with the next. With the use of a highly sensitive microphone, I found the silence around me to be filled with sound. Not only sound, but language. Dozens of languages as different from one another as Japanese is to English. English is to Russian. Listen. So the insect communicates by sound. But only man can transmit invisible signals across great distances of open space, right? Wrong. Look up into the sky. It's filled with invisible messages you'll never be able to detect. Without machines or electricity or the label of genius, the insects were using the airwaves for transmission long before man ever set foot on Earth. In the silence of a summer night, the female luna moth conducts a long-distance conversation. Its receiver at the head, its transmitter at the abdomen. The message travels not by sound, but by scent. An invisible signal called pheromone, penetrating the night air for 20 miles in every direction. The message is one of need and identity, an invitation to mate perceived only by a male of its kind. Having waited for direction, his journey begins. An all-night flight down a clearly marked path. Without this ability, such rare species would perish. Males and females unable to find one another across the great distances between. Anonymous in the night, their once-in-a-lifetime courtship begins. Their missions now complete through this miracle of reunion. drunk and disorderly. No, no, you were charming. <laughs> no, really. No. No, I'm glad we spoke up on them. You had me fooled for a minute. I thought you were just another American lady executive. Self-made, independent, ambitious, ambivalent. Over here... The insect and all the lower forms are dedicated to species survival. 
Survival comes through reproduction, reproduction through mating. For man, unless the setting is right, the, the perfume is right, the music is sweet, and at least one partner feels loved by the other, the reproductive act might never occur. As biological mechanisms, you can see that this is not terribly efficient. Males and females of all other life forms are drawn together in the direct and singular interest of reproduction. We earlier demonstrated that the insect has only a semblance of heart. Let it now be known he has no soul. Free from the concept of romance, the act of procreation occurs as simply, naturally, and obliviously as eating. Neither does beauty play a part, for the only requisite between consenting adults is that they be of the same species. Between two jumping spiders, close relatives of the insect, a ritual of semaphore signals communicates identity and willingness to proceed. In a macabre parody of the norm, the male's sexual organ is located in a modified foreleg called the palp. The incredible feat of engineering called web building is done for two purposes. First, to catch a meal. Second, to catch a mate. Among the family of spiders, the female black widow is the greatest temptress of all. Throbbing with obese sexuality, her rhythmic movement upon the strands excites a lover one-tenth her size to cautiously come forth. Seeming to know that his life might well end in the attempt, he carefully considers before throwing caution to the wind. Never did a more gentle lover exist. For one false move, and the widow will live up to her name. Stroking her abdomen as a token gesture to foreplay, he hurries on with his business. Too close for retreat, he gives his fate to a more powerful urge. With a sexual organ extending from his palp, he unites in mindless ecstasy. Black Widow, the most exciting part of sex is to escape. Puncturing his head, she sucks his body dry. Another sacrifice to the continuation of the species.
Ever notice how from a great height a society of human beings takes on the appearance of so many ants scurrying to and fro? If you have, it's a rather dull-witted observation because there's really no similarity whatsoever. Down there, everyone has his own name, his own identity, his own path, which more often than not seems to collide with everyone else. It's quite unique to human beings, this sense of individual purpose, this need to compete with all the rest. True, as individuals, it gives us strength. But as a species, it threatens our chances for survival. Think about it sometime. If we seek a so-called perfect society, then we must look to the community of bees. For here there is no ego, no competition, no individual need. Each coming into this world with an instinctive understanding that he must support the rest. The foundation of this society is the worker, a sterile female born to the legacy of continual toil until after just three months, she dies of exhaustion. Next, there are the drones, potent and beautiful males, pampered by the workers for their singular function of mating with the queen. So specialized is their function that they are unable to eat by themselves and must be fed mouth to mouth by the workers. Larger and more imposing than the rest, it is the queen who gives the hive its energy and purpose. She is the only reproductive female, therefore the very life's blood of the species. Tending her with selfless concern, all seem to know that only so long as she lives, so lives the hive. To demonstrate the extent of this concern, I remove the queen from her flock of loyal subjects. Immediately, there is a unanimous cry of outrage. But as the news filters down through the ranks, the workers begin to act. Selecting the larvae of ordinary workers, they feed them with royal jelly, a substance which will turn the commoners into queens. As the larvae will now grow larger, royal chambers are prepared. A gigantic nursery to nurture the only hope for their questionable future. In a matter of weeks, the first two queens are born. Though mere infants, they will immediately be forced to fight for their right to inherit the throne. Clustering around them, the workers act as seconds, crowding them together so they will fight to the death, but pulling them apart so that both will not die. It is a purposefully designed test of strength. Only one queen can reign and it must be certain she is the stronger. Suddenly, the contest is over. The queen is dead. Long live the queen. Now the workers carry out a grim task. Ripping open the remaining royal chambers, they lustily devour the larvae they have so carefully tended, destroying forever pretenders to the throne. But if the hive is to endure, the virgin queen must mate. Pushed outward to the sky by the excited mob of drones, she soars high above the rest, enabling only the strongest among them to reach her side and mate. The ceremony's ended. The queen, too, begins a life of servitude. Moving across the endless expanse of honeycomb, she begins to deposit eggs. From now until the day she dies, this will be her life, celebrated but enslaved, an object of worship only so long as she serves. In the perfect society, there is neither emotion nor mercy, 
precious space cannot be wasted on those who have outlived their usefulness. Having mated with the queen, the drones are now dispensable. One by one, they are hunted down by the army of workers, captured and cruelly cast out to die. Unlike the society of man, the bees are in harmony with their environment, cooperating to serve it so it will serve them. To the flowers that feed them, bees are messengers of procreation, taking sweet nectar in exchange for carrying pollen on their legs from one plant to another, acting as the link between male and female for a life form that cannot touch. When one bee finds a rich bounty of nectar, she shares it with all. In a dance of exacting language, she informs them of its precise location, the distance, the direction, even the particular variety of flower. In this way, when one dies, no secret dies with her. Whatever each has learned will be contributed to the success of the whole. In the cooperative society, the fate of each is the destiny of all. But nature is indifferent to utopia. A predatory wasp called the bee wolf must raid the hive to sustain its own young. Like bizarre killing machines, the wasps yank the defenders from the hive and crush them in their huge jaws. For all their ingenuity, the bees are helpless, falling by the hundreds to the unreasoning brutality of nature's plan. Each worker bee can sting only once at the cost of her life, and the wasps must be stung many times. point to nature claiming war was meant to be. But here they died with reason, through selflessness, not greed. In the developing young, the blueprint of a cooperative society is etched with permanence. For here, each generation comes into this world as a continuation of the last, each individual a mere extension of the rest. Without the burden of intellect, emotion, or individual identity, these creatures were given something we weren't, the knowledge that they must work together to create the elusive utopia the perfect society. Perhaps I have been guilty of exaggeration. After all, what is this perfect society? Nothing more than a ball of paper-thin fluff. Who am I trying to kid?
the power of destruction. We can play like gods. Who are they, after all, but a bunch of wretched, unimportant, heathenistic creatures without even a passport to heaven? I am man, and man is made in God's image, and man can therefore destroy. Is it possible that these creatures are us? That in the eyes of the universe, we too are mere insects that can be destroyed at will? Only come earthquake and flood will we humbly submit that all things are relative. That little demonstration was for a purpose. If I were really God, and this was man's world you just saw destroyed, if just one man and one woman were left alive, it would take maybe two million years to put it back together again the way it was before the Holocaust. It's for these helpless creatures, without the power to reason, without the ability to imagine or dream, it would only take two weeks. Confronted with this incredible resourcefulness, this desperate desire to survive, we must wonder why. What is the value, even for oneself, to sustain an existence that must ultimately end in death? The insect has the answer. Because he never posed the question. Of the billions of living things on Earth, only man ponders his existence. His questions lead to torment, for he is unable to accept, as the insects do, that life's only purpose is life itself. Just now, these mayflies have taken their first breath of life, emerged by the thousands on a single summer day. On this very same day, they will die, fall lifeless to the earth just 18 hours after they are born. Having incubated for 12 months in the mud of the river's floor, the entire generation emerges at once to share their fleeting experience. The night that falls is their only night, the moon that shines their only moon. They will neither eat, sleep, nor ponder as mere seconds tick away the entire sum of their earthly existence. As they fly in anxious exploration, their bodies will fleetingly touch, fertilizing male with female and signaling the onset of death. All that come to rest on the land will have lived without purpose. Their eggs will die on the dry surface of the ground. But those that fall upon the water will serve to reproduce their kind. For in the very agonies of death, new life is pushed forth. Eggs of a new generation that will live only to mate, only to die for the process of living.
What is the life of a few hours' duration? Could each of their minutes have been like our years? Or are each of our years more like their minutes? How did we spend our few hours? Tormented with questions of why we were born, or like they, accepting the gift and gently saying goodbye. To its neighboring planets, the Earth is unique. For it alone was given the force called life. Among the many forms of life, man proclaims himself the apogee and believes he has an alliance with God. If the species called man does have any relationship with God, it's because he alone is able to undo God's work. I don't say he does it maliciously or on purpose. Just that as other creatures were endowed with the instinct to survive, we seem to have been endowed with the instinct to destroy. It is the need for individual luxury that creates the technology that destroys the planet making it uninhabitable for all but one, the insect. The industrial waste that poisons our air, the DDT that poisons our food source, the radiation that destroys our very flesh are to the insect nothing more than a gentle perfume. And the toxins that are killing us and our fellow creatures, the insects live, reproduce, thrive, and gain strength by virtue of our growing weakness something very unusual for you to see, which I've been saving to the last. It is to me a visual summation of the force to be unleashed if the balance tips any further in the insect's favor. It is, in a single demonstration, a portent of the future. They are called Siafu, the driver ant, a mindless, unstoppable killing machine dedicated to the destruction of everything that stands in its way. Each of them is completely blind, driven forward through the darkness by a single demanding need within, the need to kill and plunder. Marching the earth in a never-ending search for prey, their column extends for more than a mile, 20 million strong, guarded by soldiers every inch of the way. No obstacle, no weapon will quiet their lust, for they will sacrifice their lives to continue on their way. Bridging a river with their own bodies, those on the bottom will quickly drown, continually replaced by others until all have moved across, unconcerned with the ones they left behind. Wherever they pause, the land is transformed into a functioning military installation, a series of defensible trenches fanning outward from a main bivouac, which will serve as their base of operations. While living quarters are constructed within, the outside is guarded by sentries. 
soldiers stationed on ready alert who continually test the air for any sign of an enemy. If the quarters are deemed suitable, from here they will launch their attack, pillaging an area of several miles around and dragging back the spoils for storage. Like others of their kind, they too have a queen, but their mission does her little honor. Her body scratched, her legs worn to stumps from being dragged hundreds of miles, she is unceremoniously pushed into a place of safety. Those that maneuver her are born to this one job in life, called by scientists, the Royal Chariot. The barracks within are constructed of bodies, a series of living chains and ladders on which food and newly deposited eggs will be carried, a seething house of horrors. While on the outside, soldiers will soon begin to fall, more are created within. It is through pillaging that the young will be fed. And now the soldiers begin their work. Pouring out of the fortress, a raid begins. The ants fan out and form a huge pincers to encircle and confuse their prey. When the rampage has begun, it is sensed by all. Like running from a forest fire, in their very panic to escape, some will race directly into the flame. After sweeping the ground, the blind battalion surge into the trees in search of those that are seeking shelter in the branches. To the victorious soldiers will come only a small taste of the spoils. The bodies of their victims carried back whole to be evenly divided among the waiting millions. The army whose discipline has conquered even hunger is the army that must be respected by all.
what mistake one wonders did the mighty dinosaur make? Was he too so arrogant that he defied powers greater than himself? Or was he perhaps created as a momentary amusement, an idle joke to pass the empty time of a hundred million years? From what is left of an existence, one will never know. Only that a species has tried and failed, proving in his failure that he was not the chosen one. As for who the chosen one really is, only time will tell. But if we claim to be creatures of reason, we know he stands among us now, waiting patiently beside our deathbed like he has at so many others. In a logic that perhaps no man will ever understand, the true winner is the last to finish the race.